Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the BlockRef webinar organized by the British Blockchain Association. Uh, my name is Naseem Nakwi. I am the president of the BBA and editor-in-chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. I am your host for this webinar. Um, just a few announcements to make before I introduce you to our very special guest and start this webinar. Uh, the aims and objectives of these sessions is uh, to have very high quality discussions and debates around current emerging trends in the blockchain space and also to raise awareness and most importantly, educate our members uh, on key topics in the blockchain. These are uh, very biased sessions, last about 25 to 30 minutes and uh, very easy to follow format. There's no videos, just there are audio sessions, so you can uh, join in uh, whilst you are, uh, and just listen to these sessions whilst you're driving or, or, or working. Um, seven questions, and the guests will have um, about two to three minutes for each question uh, to share their views. You can also ask live questions in the chat box, and we'll try and uh, uh, sque squeeze those questions in if we have got time in the end. Um, the list of all upcoming webinars are on the website. We are hosting these sessions around once a month and um, you receive the join in link a week or so before the uh, session. For the CPD certificates, please email your um, details to our admin team and uh, send the certificates out to you. These webinars are recorded and they will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and you can view the uh, web previous webinars uh, on our YouTube channel. They are all there <coughs> for you to watch. Um, we also welcome organizations sponsoring these webinars and be very happy to, to, to promote you. Uh, and uh, this is an excellent opportunity because these webinars will be permanently available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, the ne next month we have uh, Marjan Delatin, uh, Global Head of Banking from Ripple, and she will be uh, talking about uh, Ripple. <clears throat> um, so let's get started. Today we have with us a very special guest, uh, David Holding, who is a Principal Healthcare Lead at Microsoft, and he's also our advisory board member. Um, so let's begin and um, enlighten ourselves uh, and learn more about blockchain in healthcare. So, David, uh, welcome to the webinar. Thanks very much, Nassim. It's an honor to be here. So, David, um, seven so most commonly asked questions, and the first one really is kind of looking at a very from a very macro perspective. I'm the, I'm the CEO of a hospital, I'm the, I'm the chief executive, I'm, I'm in charge. And before we actually do something with the blockchain or, or looking into investing in, in the blockchain or implementing it, first of all, why should we learn about this technology for, for those executives that have not heard about it or, or just heard a little bit about it? Why is it important to learn about this at now? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's all around the, the use cases, right? What are the use cases for healthcare? Is it provider credentialing? Is it provider directory? And, and what are the associated business values? Those are the things that the CEO is going to be interested in, I think. Is it, you know, is blockchain going to help reduce the, the cost of healthcare? Is it going to help improve patient outcomes? Is it going to help increase patient engagement? or improve experiences of both patients and healthcare professionals. Um, so those are, the, those are the key things I think a CEO would be interested in. It, it's not so much that you know, it's blockchain and that's cool, it's more around what are the particular use cases we're talking about using blockchain for, and what are the business values. And you know, blockchain, and we can talk about this more later on, but you know, it's, it's really a, it's a part of a bigger machine. It's one cog in the machine. It's not the solution. It's a small part of the overall solution. So it really has to do with, with the values that that can enable now. 
And if you take a, a sort of data centric view of blockchain, right, we, we have a lot of data, you know, we, we've worked on digitizing healthcare data for the last decade. And, you know, there's a lot of digitized data. The problem is a lot of that data is locked inside silos, doesn't get shared much if at all. And there's a lot of untapped potential in sharing data in a secure, targeted manner. When I say secure and targeted around a specific use case with specific defined business value, and uh, it, it's not all the data. There's going to be some data in databases and silos, if you will, underneath uh, EHRs or like health rec electronic health record systems. Some of that data will remain private, right? And, and rightly so. But, you know, some of the data is can and should be shared for defined business value. Again, reducing cost of care, improving patient outcomes, et cetera. And that's really where blockchain can, can fit in and add value. And, you know, it, one of the analogies I use is, you know, we've all changed phone numbers or addresses at some point, right? And what do you have to do when that happens? You have to go and update that information in hundreds of websites, right? Uh, what if there was a way, rather than storing that information and maintaining it in all these different places at n times the cost, what if there was a way to put that common data on blockchain? Because we have that similar problem in healthcare where the same redundant data is stored all over the place. And it's not that it's so much that it's stored because storage is cheap, but it's that it needs to be maintained in all these different places. And the fact is it doesn't get maintained very well and it ends up being uh, inconsistent and there's all kinds of friction in the health system aside from it costing n times as much to, to maintain it because we're doing it redundantly all over the place. If, if we put that data on blockchain, it's one times the cost to maintain it. Any updates ripple across the consortium near real time. And, you know, there is no inconsistency because we're all using the same record of truth in the, in the blockchain shared ledger. So as a CEO, you know, think about, you know, the use cases, think about the business values, but think about the data, the data you have, and that some of that data is not differentiating to your business. It's, you know, it's, it's data that could be shared and, and jointly maintained across a consortium of healthcare organizations, maybe a, a network of providers for mutual benefit and um, in, you know, reducing cost and so forth. So um, the last reason I think a CEO should care about blockchain is it, it does um, impact the privacy security compliance landscape and, and, you know, CEOs in healthcare need to be concerned about privacy security compliance. We, we know that privacy is one of those things. If you do it well, you won't necessarily win, but if you do it poorly, you can burn, right? So, um, and security, if you do that poorly, there's ransomware, there's breaches, et cetera. Compliance, if you do that poorly, you get into hot water with, with data protection laws and regulations. So blockchain does impact that, that landscape, if you will, privacy, security, compliance. So CEOs should be concerned about it from that standpoint. And it's not just that blockchain's a risk, right, or that it introduces risks. Blockchain actually introduces some incredible new benefits as far as privacy, right, and, and capabilities. So um, it, it's a double-edged sword, but CEOs really need to understand it from that uh, standpoint as well. And you, you, you mentioned about obviously data sharing, privacy, and, uh, and and some other use cases. When I talk to uh, lots of hospital CEOs, um, especially the NHS, and their the, the, the question is um, always, well, what uh, what problems can it solve like right now? I mean, are there use established uh, uh, use cases, uh, up and running projects? The other question is, will it be a, to a top down approach or a bottom up approach? We say, well, we give more kind of um, um, powers to patient, they, they own and control their data. So do you think a project should be a bottom up or, or a top down from a, from a government or executive level approach? Yeah, um, there's so many different directions we could take that question. It's a really good one. Um, what I would what I would say, and this is partly for my role as, as chair of the HIMSS Blockchain and Healthcare Task Force, is that you know it, it's really about the network, the, not so much the IT network. We know blockchain runs on an IT network. It's the network of healthcare organizations. Blockchain is a consortium thing, right? So um, what mm -hmm. problems can blockchain solve for patients right now? Think about what healthcare networks exist right now? Is it payment networks? Is it health information exchange networks? Is it drug supply chains? Is it medical device supply chains? Is it clinical trials networks, uh, clinical research networks, et cetera? Think about, you know, where are there networks of healthcare organizations and how are those networks functioning today? 
And are there ways that blockchain could add value in terms of, you know, near real time transparency, immutability to build trust um, and so forth, all the things around cryptocurrencies, crypto tokens to incent, you know, sharing and collaboration. The early use cases we're seeing. Um, so just just to add one more thing on the network side, it's, it's really the existing networks that are the low hanging fruit for blockchain. So if you talk about solving problems right now, building new networks of healthcare organizations around new use cases takes a long time, right? And so those aren't near term opportunities. Near term opportunities are existing healthcare consortia. And so the, the um, the existing healthcare networks or consortia that we see and the use cases that are getting early traction in, you know, blockchain and healthcare are, you know, provider credentialing. Uh, today you have a doctor with an MD or a nurse with an RN or there's countless other credentials. Those need to be, you know, checked. They need to be um, validated by all the different healthcare providers that, you know, the healthcare professional practices at. And not just they need, they need to be validated, but they need to be validated by every single organization on a repeated basis, like every two years. And so there's a lot of redundant work. There's a lot of delay. They can't practice until they've been credentialed, et cetera. What if that, those credentials and the validations of those credentials are on blockchain? Right. And so we can yeah. eliminate a lot of that redundant work. We can eliminate the delay to get doctors practicing. You know, if, if a new um, NHS trust, for example, was able to look on a blockchain, you know, has this doctor been credentialed? Has it been validated recently? And if the answer is yes, and it's another NHS trust, we're good. Let that doctor practice right away. That's real benefit to the doctor. It's real benefit to the healthcare organization. It's real benefit to patients in terms of being able to be seen sooner because doctors aren't sitting on the sidelines waiting to be credentialed. So, um, you know, provider credentialing is one. Provider directory is another. Medical device supply chains or medical device track and trace. Uh, drug, uh, drug supply chains. Um, health information exchanges uh, for clinical trials, for example, um, digital sample tracking, mm. kind of a digital sample or um, uh, uh, tracking of, you know, even human samples like a tissue sample from a biopsy or something, tracking those kind of like a supply chain tracking yeah. or a chain of custody tracking can happen on blockchain for clinical research. Those are some of the early use cases we see for blockchain in healthcare. I think longer term, there's, there's amazing use cases around empowering patients with their data and self-sovereign identity and decentralized identity and all that stuff. Um, those will take longer to happen, I think. Um, uh, I think a lot of the initial use cases will be on the enterprise sort of B2B side. And one of the major sort of business values they, the early ones seem to target is cost reduction. Hey, if you, if you use blockchain and, and in this way for this use case, you will reduce your costs. You will reduce the cost of healthcare. So those are, those are some of the early opportunities we see for blockchain right now in healthcare. Yeah, I think it's some really good examples there. Um, the next question is, people ask, well, there's so many different types of blockchain. So which type of blockchain to use? So there is, is Hyperledger, there's the private permission blockchains, there are open blockchains. So, so w which type of blockchain to use? Yeah, and it, again, I would take it back to the, the use case and, and the business value. And there's a security privacy compliance dimension to this as well is um, that the vast majority, and I'm the messenger here, Not this is not me <laughs> advocating religion. Um, the vast, vast majority of healthcare use cases with blockchain that we're seeing are private consortium use cases, not public blockchain. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, in healthcare, we need to separate ourselves from what I call blockchain religion, which is it's not blockchain if it's not public. Um, what healthcare cares about is what is the use case for healthcare and what is the business value? How's it going to reduce the cost of care, improve patient outcomes, engagement, experiences, et cetera. And then, you know, how does blockchain support that? Not here's a blockchain hammer, go find a nail to hit. Healthcare is not interested in that. That's a recipe mm -hmm. for disaster. What we need to do is focus on the healthcare use case, the healthcare values and how blockchain can support. So the vast majority, I would say upwards of 99% of the use cases we're seeing with blockchain and healthcare are private consortium. And one of the big forcing functions for that is most healthcare organizations have regulations or data protection laws that require only authorized access to healthcare data. Healthcare data is very sensitive, protected healthcare information or PHI often it's called. 
and and that's you know obviously a superset of PII or personally identifiable information. And so, you know, that doesn't just get shared with anyone that gets shared only on an as needed basis to support healthcare. And so only authorized access to healthcare data. One of the ways to ensure authorized access to healthcare data is to know what organizations have access to what you're sharing on blockchain. And that's precisely what a private consortium blockchain is, is all of the entities participating in the blockchain are well known and highly trusted and they have an authorized you know need to know and uh and, and so you know frankly again i'm just the messenger here but that's what we're seeing that's why a lot of healthcare organizations are gravitating to to private consortium blockchains as far as the um uh, the particular blockchain platform, you know, the three sort of enterprise ready ones that, that we're seeing are Hyperledger Fabric, you know, uh, Ethereum, mostly on the enterprise Ethereum side, and um, R3 Corda. And, you know, there's many, many others out there. And, you know, they have different merits, different performance characteristics, different consensus algorithms, different constraints, different ad advantages. Um, but I think, you know, in, in some ways, uh, one can get started with blockchain and isolate one's self or the consortium, the enterprise systems you're connecting to the blockchain. You can isolate the blockchain uh, behind sort of APIs that you control. So isolate the blockchain architecturally. I think one of the things that that um, is a problem is there's, there's some consortia out there that would like to do blockchain. They're not sure what platform to go with. They're kind of deer in the headlights. Uh, it's best to select the best one today and, and isolate it architecturally, and that enables you to, to change in the future to a different platform if you need to with minimal impact uh, because you've isolated the blockchain platform behind an API you control. Uh, that way you can get started. You can start learning. You can iterate, you know, uh, test, pilot, and learn and improve. And, um, you know, blockchains, the platforms available today are going to change going forward. So... Um, even if there was the perfect one for you today, you know, it's going to change going forward. So it's good to have that architectural flexibility anyway. Um, and I, I think part of the question, what type of blockchain is, you know, how to deploy it, um, you know, blockchain is really a foundational platform. So, you know, as such, it, it will have a heterogeneous deployment architecture, just like the internet, right? I mean, internet, you know, there's, there's all different kinds of servers and things that run on the internet. Blockchain will have a heterogeneous deployment architecture. Some blockchain nodes could run on-premise. Uh, for example, if a healthcare organization wanted a blockchain node on-premise, it might run in the DM of that healthcare organization, you know, between the external and internal firewall uh, where other externally facing things like web servers would go. Um, the, the other options, of course, for deploying blockchain nodes are in the cloud and, and Microsoft Azure supports that pretty much deploying uh, most of the um, blockchain platforms. Uh, and, um, uh, but there's, there's lots of different cloud deployment options. Um, and ultimately we'll see a mix, right? The important thing is, if you have a certain consortium and you have a certain blockchain, you know, let's say it's a private consortium blockchain, because most of them are in healthcare. Um, the important thing is all the blockchain nodes need to speak the same consensus algorithm because that's how they communicate to ensure the consistency and validity of the shared ledger. Um, but, you know, those, yeah. those nodes can often run, you know, in a mixed way like that. Some could run in on-prem, some could run in the cloud, they can run in different clouds and so forth. So I'll pause there to see if there's anything more on that question. Yeah, no, I think uh, excellent explanation. Um, the, I'll probably combine the next two questions, just again, what are the, the major challenges in, to in, in deployment of blockchain for, for healthcare? And yep. what are the problems which blockchain does <laughs> not solve? Yeah, and um, there's just so much depth to blockchain and healthcare, and <laughs> I know we could spend you know, a half an hour on each of the, each of these, but I'll keep it concise and just tell me if you'd like to go deeper. Um, but on the biggest challenges I see, um, you know, what is blockchain? A lot of healthcare is not sure what it is and what it isn't, and you know, so there's a lot of confusion out there. We see things like, you know, uh, should we really use blockchain because it's not very green, right? It uses too much electric power, it's too much hardware, etc. Which, which is not applicable in healthcare. Because um, in healthcare, again, the vast majority, upwards of 99% of the blockchain activity in healthcare, I mean, not just interest, real activity in terms of pilots with real healthcare consortia, 
that are actually transacting on blockchain. 99% plus are, are doing private consortium blockchain. And private consortium blockchain does not have a concept of mining. And so there's no excessive use of electric power. There's no excessive use of hardware. Blockchain is not yeah. CPU bound. Blockchain is not storage bound because what we put on the shared ledger is lightweight, minimal but sufficient. Most of the heavy data and the, most of the sensitive data will, will be off in the enterprise system, systems like EHRs, not on the blockchain. So, um, you know, we, we got to resolve confusion about it not being green, et cetera. Um, 